Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just one minute. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for 11th Hour Racing's webinar on tools for a plastic-free ocean. My name is Michelle Carnavali, and I manage our grant-making program here at 11th Hour Racing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with 11th Hour Racing, we're based uh, here in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, and we work with sailing community and the marine industry to advance solutions and practices that protect and restore the health of our ocean. We invest in projects and programs that integrate sustainability into their values and operations while spreading the important message of ocean stewardship. And we believe that fostering environmentally sustainable practices on and off the water is critical to the preservation of our ocean and its vital resources. We're joined today by one of our grantees, Emily Penn, who's the founder of X Expedition. Emily will be giving us an overview of her work through X Expedition and the spectrum of solutions and actions we can all take for a plastic-free ocean. But before I turn it over to Emily for her short presentation, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items about the webinar. Please uh, type all of your questions and comments into the question box located on your toolbar. Um, all of you are muted, so if you have a question, um, please feel free to type it there and we'll have question and answers after Emily's presentation. Also, this webinar will be recorded in case you want to share it with others uh, who could not make it today or you want to review it again. Um, that link will be sent out as a follow-up email after today's webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to Emily. Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in uh, this evening or this morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so we haven't got that long, and I'm gonna kind of crack on with what I want to say. Um, but really, uh, part of it is, celebrating the amazing success that we are in at the moment um, with the just raised consciousness really for this plastic pollution issue um, that we're now seeing around the world. And I'm sure wherever you live, uh, you've seen in the last few months, a lot of noise in the media, um, on the side of Volvo ocean race campaigns, David Attenborough, all over social media, people are talking about this issue of plastic, uh, which for me, having dedicated about the last 10 years of my life to this issue, um, is really great news that people are listening and seem to really do care um, about it. And the big challenge we now have on our hands is what do we do and how do we turn all of this amazing energy into real action? Um, so a little bit about why I became interested in this issue. Um, a decade ago, I got a chance to take a boat around the world where I actually saw this firsthand. I saw these small islands struggling with plastic pollution. I saw it far out in the most remote parts of our planet. And from there, I went on to set up an organization called Pangea that owns a 72 foot sailing yacht. And for the best part of the last decade, we have been sailing uh, along with the campaign that I run X Expedition, We've been sailing around the world studying this issue of plastic. And 
it began very much about the science and about understanding the issue better and collecting data and samples. But along the way, we had the most amazing community of people join us, the scientists, but also the filmmakers, journalists, artists, educators, and they would all come back to land and go on to then want to do more and take what they'd seen and turn it into action. And so along the way, we focused more on the advocacy side. Um, just uh, during our round Britain last voyage in uh, last summer, uh, these are just a couple of the snapshots of the work the crew was doing in Parliament and with communities and standing up in front of the media or audiences um, talking about this issue, plastic, that they deeply care about and what needs to be done to change it. Recently, that's led on to some other workshops um, that have also been supported by 11th Hour Racing, such as this one with the Volvo Ocean Race athletes, the sailors that are currently sailing around the world, talking about how they can actually be champions for the ocean and help see change as well. Um, but the thing that I really want to focus on today is a new piece of this project that we're just launching, which is our Ocean Change Makers website, a toolkit of resources to help individuals, hopefully like yourselves, uh, like these other sailors that have either been on our voyages um, or have an opportunity to do something for the ocean. Um, and it's a group of resources to um, help kind of figure out where to start. Um, so I want to talk a little bit first about the ideas behind this toolkit and what it contains, and then I'm gonna switch over to the website itself and give you a little tour around. Um, so it's very simply divided into three sections, three what I feel are the really key sections when we're trying to tackle any problem. Um, one is understanding it. Um, of course, you can't figure out how to solve it until you really know what the issue is. Um, and then secondly, to try and understand the solutions. What are our different ways of tackling it? And then thirdly, what does that actually mean we can go and do? And so the toolkit's very simply organized into those three categories. Um, first, I want to delve into the knowledge section. On the website, you can find books, talks, films, scientific papers, um, depending on how you like to consume uh, knowledge, you should be able to find something there that works for you. Um, the way that I like to communicate what I know is through talks and presentations. So I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of what I think are the key facts. And at the same time, share a little bit about how I might give a presentation um, about this issue as well, in case that's something that you are also interested in doing. Um, so one of the key things about giving a presentation um, about something that you care about is I love to share a little bit um, of why I care and a bit about my personal story. Um, so for me, it begins with this crazy image of the boat that I first went round the world on and discovered this issue of plastic in our oceans and stopping at these small islands where I was witnessing these local communities that basically their sea level rising, causing their soil to become very salty and their collapse in fisheries means they're now relying on importing packaged food and drink and have nowhere for that waste to go. And it was this moment standing on a beach in Tonga in the South Pacific that I realized that I really wanted to do something about it. So once I've explained a little bit about why I care, now there's a couple of tools that I really like to use to talk about the issue of plastic. One of them is this image here, an image by Chris Jordan, who's an artist, and he's showing here 60,000 plastic bags. I love to get school kids in particular to guess how often we use 60,000 plastic bags, which alarmingly, in the world is just every three seconds. Another tool I've been using recently is from a website called The World Counts. This 
alarming number, which is just free flowing in front of your eyes, is actually the number of plastic bags produced each year. And this was the number as it approached the end of 2017 in December, which really just shows, kind of like blows you away um, on the, the sheer scale of this issue we have of single use plastic. And then talk a little bit about the fact that all of that plastic, it's designed to last forever, that material. And we go and make things that are designed to be used once and then thrown away. One option is recycling that material. If we could turn it back into new things, then it wouldn't become waste. But then when we look at the issue of re recycling, we realize that those numbers are around nine or 10% of plastic that gets recycled worldwide because these materials, as you can see in that picture there, um, are often quite complicated. There's many different materials that we call plastic. And in order to recycle them effectively, they have to be cleaned, sorted and separated, a very expensive and time consuming process. So to summarize, um, really the, the sort of one of the takeaway facts here, which I like to communicate, is the fact that we're using a material that lasts forever and we make things that are designed to be used once and then thrown away. So much of that plastic, it ends up finding its way down streams, drains, rivers, and eventually everything runs downhill to the ocean. And whether you're in Los Angeles here or a country like Indonesia, which really doesn't have any waste management system, that plastic only ends up going one way down these rivers out into the ocean and eventually ends up meeting ocean currents and moving into what we call gyres, these five hot spots around the world where the plastic accumulates in the middle of our ocean. So to summarize that next fact is the fact that 8 million tons of plastic enters our ocean each year. And one of the statistics comments that if no, no action is taken, there'll actually be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. And then the final piece of knowledge that I like to impart on people is that it's not about going out there looking for islands and these great big rafts of plastic that we could scoop up and bring back home but when we're out there doing our science we use this net called a manta trawl and we skim it along the surface of the ocean and we're really looking for what we call microplastics these tiny fragments of plastic and most of the plastic that's floating on our ocean is this big it's smaller than your little fingernail and it gets that size because the sun causes it to photodegrade into these little fragments. Um, and also the wind and the wave action kind of breaks it down. Um, and, and then it, it just gets smaller and smaller. It's not biodegrading or going back into the natural circle um, that our planet relies on. Um, it's just ending up as a fine soup covering the whole surface of our ocean. And at that size, it can then get into the food chain. It can get mistaken for food, get into the stomach of fish and move its way up the food chain. Not so much the plastic itself, but often the chemicals that that plastic is either manufactured with or chemicals that adhere to that plastic because of its oil based properties when it's in the ocean. And so, um, Going back to another kind of personal part of my story, uh, several years ago, I decided to test my own blood to find if I had any of these chemicals that are in plastic and in our seas, um, actually inside my own body. And after testing for 35 of these toxic banned chemicals, we found 29 of those 35 in my body. And so this was another real turning point for me um, that really fueled our X expedition campaign, uh, specifically looking then at the connection between these toxics and female health, um, and has really 
led on to much of what we're doing now. So to summarise that final point about microplastics, it's the fact that these little fibres and pieces of plastic that are basically impossible to clean up um, is the main problem in our seas and then it can get ingested in the food chain. So those are some of my kind of key pointers. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. But in this short webinar, that's scratching the surface. You can delve into the knowledge section on the toolkit to get at a much, much more in-depth um, understanding of some of those issues. And to quickly summarize um, the points that I made about talking about this issue that you care about, how to share it with friends, family, your workplace, your community. Um, these are the three key things that I try and think about when talking about the issue. One, make it personal to you. Is it that you grew up close to the ocean? Is it that you get upset every time you walk outside your front door and you see, you know, the big overflowing bin? You know, what is it that's got you thinking like this? Number two, get those facts across. And number three, give someone a call to action. There's no point just talking about the doom and gloom of what's going on if you're not going to then throw in a positive light at the end of the tunnel as to what somebody can actually do about it. And we're going to return to that action point um, a little bit later. Uh, first, I just want to go back to those three sections on the website. I've shared with you some of those key facts about the issue. Next, I want to delve into solutions before we wrap up with the action section. So when we're talking about solutions for ocean plastic, one of the challenges is that almost everywhere we look at the moment, um, there's some new amazing idea for solving this issue, uh, which is great. You know, there's ideas to build amazing technology to go out and clean it up. There's shoes that have been made, made out of reclaimed plastic from the ocean. There's turning waste into energy and there's bans, there's education, but sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming and you almost think, gosh, there's so much to do. Where can I start and where should I start? So I've developed a little exercise to try and help people think through that process um, and hopefully try and pinpoint the place that it's right to start for you. Um, because one thing that I now know for sure is there's no right answer to solve this issue. And it's a case of all of us using the unique skills and opportunities that we all have in different ways to tackle it. So um, thinking about this framework of where a solution sits on the spectrum from the ocean, which is where we see the problem, where all that plastic ends up, all the way up to the source um, of you know where that plastic begins. So that's the framework that we're kind of talking about. And this workshop um, is best played on a large table with lots of friends and lots of post-it notes. There's actually a write-up in the toolkit of a step-by-step -step process of how you could run this um, workshop at home uh, or with a group of people. And essentially what we're getting at is that you can try and clean up the plastic that's already out there. You can look at ways to scoop it up from the gyres, those accumulation zones out at sea, and look at ways to try and get it off our coastline. And essentially, that is minimizing the damage that that plastic is already causing, which is good for the oceans. Um, but it's still not necessarily solving the problem because if we've still got this constant flow of plastic into the ocean, then um, we haven't actually overcome it. So to step one level up, there's lots of ways at the moment that different industries and companies are looking at using a material two or three times before it ends up um, ultimately as a waste product. Um, so that could be redesigning a new material, in this case here, a shoe out of ocean plastic, or turning much of that waste into energy uh, that we would usually get from fossil fuels. But still, there's going to be a waste product at some point at the end. So the next layer up 
is thinking about this idea of closed loop or what's being talked about a lot at the moment in the media as circular economy. And this idea that if you could make a bottle forever, uh, you'd never have that waste um, or making one product that can easily be turned into another. And ultimately, getting right close to the source at the top of that spectrum, it's just ways that we can avoid using plastic altogether. And then we don't need to look at how we manage any resource because we're using an alternative instead. And so to summarize on that spectrum, um, looking at how you can kind of, when you come up with a solution or hear about something, start thinking in your mind, where does it sit on that spectrum? And ultimately, if we can get closer to the source, then it's a kind of better way of solving the problem. Some of the challenges though, is as you get closer to the source, it is a lot harder, more time consuming, maybe costs a lot more money to create that big change than it would be to work at the other end of the spectrum, um, where you can actually quite quickly and easily and cheaply um, minimize the impact that this pollution is already happening. So there's pros and cons basically to working um, at every level of this spectrum. Um, and then we can start thinking about how some of those solutions that we've got down on the table, some of them will be things that government have the ability to do, some of them companies and businesses can very easily take on, and others we can do as individuals or in our communities. Um, we have actually on the website kind of drawn up what the end of one of these workshops would look like. Um, it, it looks a bit complicated on this slide here, but if you get a chance to take some time to have a look through it on the website, you'll see that basically all of these solutions fall into a different box on this matrix. And the way this will hopefully help you is to think about which column you might want to be in um, and then which section you have an impact to actually um, have an influence in and figure out where your own lever for change is and where you can actually have an impact. So that's a little bit about how we can think about all these different solutions and organize them better in our head so it's not so overwhelming. Um, and now to move on to the last section the action section. How do we then, once we've decided where we want to work, how do we then do it? And how do we get some guidance from others who've done it before us? Um, so at this point, I'm going to take you over to um, the actual website. Um, so here it is. You can see here, this is just the, the home page, um, and it goes down and talks about those three sections. Um, and then the first one here, knowledge, is listed, as I mentioned, into very straightforwardly um, into these sections. So for example, scientific papers, um, we've pulled out the key dozen papers that we think are really important on this issue and um, that are all peer reviewed and divided them into different categories, for example, human impact. So you can easily find what you need with nice, simple summaries. Um, or if it's books that you're interested in, again, I'm not gonna go through every single page of this, but the main section I want to get onto here after solutions is action. Um, this is now organized into all the different ways that you could take action. And I'm gonna flick through some of these pages so you have an idea on the type of uh, resources that are available. Um, so personal action, there's lots you can do yourself. There's a plastic free lifestyle guide here, which helps you eliminate as much plastic as possible within your own home um, and your sort of day to day life. Um, if you spend a lot of time at sea, there's a guide to look at how you can do that on your boat. Um, over here on the left, it's different campaigns um, and so on looking at how you can actually do a waste audit um, and, and all of those other different ways you can personally um, take action. Um, moving on to organizations, this is lots of other campaigns that are out there that are running that you can join, um, all clearly labeled there into, you know, depending on what it is that you're interested in, that you're passionate about, to find others um, that are working on the same thing as you. Um, and it goes on from there, 
in the field is the next category. So that's looking at if you're going on a sailing adventure, you might want to try and do some research, to have some more understanding. Um, legislation is looking at how to contact your local politicians, um, set up petitions and so on. Um, there's a section for community that involves things like beach cleanups, giving talks, organizing film screenings, and finally, young people. Um, that's then obviously looking at kids, how they can get involved, um, and the education side of things as well. So there's some, some guides on action. Um, it's by no means complete in that there's always more that we can be doing. Um, if any of you are out there who know of other resources or have a burning desire to see a resource that um, really should be on here, um, then please do get in touch and let us know. The final tab I want to show you is this on collaboration. Um, one of the things we're really trying to do at the moment is help people locally connect on an issue, um, on the plastics issue. Um, if you would like to be part of that growing community, you can add yourself to the map and also find others. Um, for example, Soraya here, who has put her details on because she's very interested in collaborating with others locally on the issue. Um, and that brings us to our Facebook page, which we've just launched called Ocean Changemakers, um, which is going to be the hub of discussion um, and ongoing way to kind of keep in touch uh, with everybody working on this issue. So I know we're getting quite close to the end of our webinar. Um, so I want to stop there so that we have time to answer some questions. Thank you, Emily. That was fantastic. And a reminder to everybody on the webinar, please type your questions into the question box on your toolbar on the side of the webinar. We've already had a couple of questions come through. Um, and the first one from Paul um, was about your mention of testing your own blood for plastic compounds. And how easy is that to get done in the UK or elsewhere? And do we know how they affect the human body or the implications of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just also put my webcam on so I can say hello and you can stop having to just look at a plain screen. Um, so in terms of getting the bloods done, it's a very common question. I wish there was um, a brilliant answer. Um, we did ours with a lab in Sweden several years ago. Uh, as part of the United Nations Safe Planet campaign. Um, and they've now actually finished that project. There's no ongoing funding to carry on doing that testing. Um, and so there's nowhere at the moment that I know of that you can go and, and do it. Um, a private lab could do it for you, but it is unfortunately um, a pretty expensive uh, test to have done. Um, hopefully, though, the more consciousness that we have around this issue, the more available that will be. Do researchers know um, the implications for human health impacts of having this in our bloodstreams? Yeah, so um, most of the chemicals that we found inside us, some of them were carcinogens um, that lead to cancer, but most of them are what, what we call endocrine disruptors. So they mimic hormones and they stop those hormones, those chemical messages that are coming from the brain around the body, telling the different organs to, you know, when to start the next process in your body. Um, and if they block that hormone getting through, then those chemical messages don't arrive. Um, and that's really what these endocrine disruptors are doing. And so they are generally um, not good to have inside you during puberty, fertility, pregnancy, those times when it's very important for, he, for the hormones to be getting through at the right time. Um, and so there's lots of sort of documented um, sort of health consequences, um, mostly in development uh, for having those chemicals inside us. Got you. Um, what are the, your views around the legislative priorities in the UK for plastic? And what do you see as the means for achieving those? Yeah, oh, good question. Um, it's So I think the challenge really at the moment is uh, for the research to be done on what really the solutions are. And I think one of the challenges the government has is 
um, they are not necessarily set up to be doing all of the research and development for what all of those solutions, for example, a supermarket might look like. Um, and so while they can say, we want to ban all single use plastic, which for me would be a brilliant legislative outcome. Uh, at the moment, we aren't at the point where a supermarket could turn around tomorrow and carry on um, providing us all with food in central London. Um, you know, with the technology that's currently available, it just simply doesn't exist. So um, my view is that we need businesses to be incentivized to figure out what those solutions look like, what those new technologies look like, investment into those new technologies, and then let the legislation um, legislate those solutions that come out of it. Emily, I know you've been giving this type of training and longer trainings all around the world. Um, and I wonder what are some of the biggest challenges or obstacles you hear from people or organizations trying to take action and are there any good success stories that you know you find inspirational? Sure. Um, so I think often the biggest challenge um, that I hear is is that sort of where do we start? You know, we we all care about it, um, but but how do we know where to begin? And um, I kind of whiz through that uh, the, the sort of workshop that we often run, um, which is quite hard to do uh, on a webinar. But um, I think I, I really believe in that process of trying to distill uh, where is it that you want to start based on what opportunity do you actually have to create change um, and what is your kind of skill set um, to be able to begin. And I would also say uh, that, you know, there is no right answer and there's no wrong answer um, in that we should all be starting to do something and realize that lots of other people out there are too, which is a great reason why we should all start connecting and collaborating more um, to be able to to work together. Um, but that that is definitely the biggest challenge. It's the where do you start? But I promise you, as soon as you do start, you start picking off the things that you can begin with. And then it opens up so many more doors. You meet more people and then things start to snowball. Um, so the main thing is just just get going. Um, some success stories that I've seen. Um, we have had amazing teams come off the boat um, people who've then seen this issue uh, firsthand and go on to set up their own organizations um, to lead and champion campaigns in their local community whether it's a plastic free um, town or uh, going and making a documentary film um, and that going on to win awards and you know take them in new career directions that they uh, had never imagined and um, we had a, a couple of our ambassadors actually give TED talks in the last uh, few months, which has been uh, amazing to see um, their personal journeys, um, as well as the huge impact and contribution that they're having on the community around them. Uh, one question is if the website will uh, be sharing any of those success stories as well as a type of way to gain momentum in other parts of the world? Absolutely, I'd love to do that. Um, whether it's on the website or maybe to begin with on Facebook, it's certainly on our list, um, our long list of things to do, um, that we would love to start getting those stories up. Um, so if you're someone that's um, already been connected with us, um, I know we had some of those success stories come out recently in uh, one of our meetups, um, then send it our way and we'll be reaching out to people in our community to, to get that captured and shared as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we've reached our 30 minute uh, time slot, so I'm gonna have to end it here, but thank you all to the people who have asked questions. If we didn't get to your questions, I'm gonna forward them on to Emily and she can follow up with you directly. Um, as a follow up to today, as the webinar ends, there will be a very, very short uh, survey if you can let us know if this webinar was helpful or useful or the types of topics if you'd like to learn more about. Um, and we'll be sending a follow-up email with the recording as well as some information on how you can connect um, with Emily and X Expedition. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye.